All right. Today, we begin a series on transformation, and we're going to talk about the heart of the matter, how one goes about becoming a different person. Remember that we said last week that we have a maximum impact statement. Individually and as a church family, we strive to be a people who are experiencing such a powerful walk with God that it radically impacts our lives, the lives of those around us, and ultimately our community, our city, our culture, and our cosmos. But in order for all that to happen, something must happen inside of us. You know, the number one killer of people in America in the last few years has been heart disease. Nearly 600,000 people plus a year die from heart disease. It outranks cancer, emphysema, diabetes, and a host of other diseases. Health experts in our society are so concerned about heart disease that it is a focus of a great amount of research money. And we are told constantly about the dangers of this serious condition. We're told to limit our fat and cholesterol intake as well as to exercise all to avoid what? Heart disease. Spiritually speaking, the greatest danger any individual faces is spiritual heart disease. It is the number one disabler of Christians and churches, and of course it is the determiner of heaven or hell. The reason for the ineffectiveness of so many of us who claim to be believers is that our hearts simply are not right with God. Perhaps today as we speak and talk, we have a problem with heart disease. This morning we're going to look at, God willing, our spiritual hearts are. We're going to look at what our spiritual hearts are. We're going to define them and then describe what goes, inside, goes on inside of them. And finally, we're going to examine and see if any of us suffers from spiritual heart disease. Diagnose the type we might be de dealing with and present the cure. So listen closely today as we talk about heart disease and this whole idea of transformation. Understand that transformation is not simply about education. Knowledge is great, right? When we fill your mind with knowledge, we say this, this, this. It's great, but it primarily changes the head. It's not simply about reformation, making an effort to be a better person, because effort primarily changes external behavior. And you can change your external behavior and still not really be changed. You're just doing it to fake us out, right? It's not simply about imitation. You know what? I saw Jesus or I saw a good example. Examples primarily change our outward patterns, but again, they don't change us on the inside. And it's not simply about motivation because oftentimes the want to doesn't equal the will do. How many of you want to change? But do you change? How many of you say, oh, I'm gonna? You got great intentions, right? Like myself, I'm trying to walk two and a half miles a day. But I can find a million excuses not to do it. Looks like it might be too cold today. Looks like it might be too hot today. Chance of rain today. Chance of good weather today. My clicker course is giving me trouble. Transformation is a work of God accomplished in us. That is to say, in our hearts that actually changes who we are from the inside out. I'm going to say something radical today. You need to change. Oh, you know, I'm happy with the way I, I, I am. I know that. That's why you need to change. All of us need to change from the inside out. But let's look at the heart. What is the heart? Well, in a physical sense, it is the chief organ of physical life. It supplies the body with what it needs to keep going. Once the heart has stopped beating, the individual stops living. Put your hand right here. Shh, quiet. You feel that? That's a good sign. If you don't have that, you ain't. 
The heartbeat is critical. And once the heart stops beating, the individual stops living. But in a spiritual sense, it is the essence, or it is in essence, our inner private world. The center of our personality and the place where God reveals himself to us, it is our chief spiritual organ. Your spiritual heart is critical to your life. As we walk through this now, we want to describe really what happens in your heart. The heart is a secret place. What goes on in our hearts is not generally known by others. Now they say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But they got more cameras in Vegas than you want to know. A lot of times what happens on Vegas stays on YouTube forever. You been to Vegas, girl? <laughs> but, but, nobody knows what goes on in your heart but you. Nobody. See, you could have come in here today smiling from ear to ear, but mad as the dickens inside. You could come in here acting like everything is fine, thank you, Jesus. But inside... You're rotting. And I would not know because it's a secret place. Samuel says, but the Lord said to Samuel, or in Samuel it says, the Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance. They're going to choose a king. Or on his height of his stature because I have rejected him. He's talking about some of David's sons. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks where? The outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart. The only thing I can see of you is the outward you. Now, I want to say, you're a fine-looking group of people. Very good-looking people. All of you, very good-looking people. But I don't know what it looks like on the inside, do I? Now, here's the hardest thing for us to come to grips with. Not only is the heart a secret place, it's a sinful place. The Bible says that my heart and your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. My heart is a liar. Well, don't be amen in my heart. Oh, come on, man. Your heart too. Come on, man. Your heart too. Our hearts lie to us. Our hearts lie to us all the time. They are deceitful and desperately wicked. Look what this verse says. In Mark 7, 21, 23. I've shown you this verse before. It says, from within... Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these, all these evil things come from where? Within. And they defile a person. You want to know why someone does what they do? It's a heart thing. Why did they do that? Because their heart. Why did I do that? Because your heart. Our hearts are broke from the start. I can put you in the best, best possible position. I can, I, can, I can give you money. I can give you food. I can give you education. I can give you everything. And you're still going to be a sinner. And you're still going to sin. Why? It's a heart thing. It's a heart thing. You'll say, oh, oh, pastor, if I had plenty of money. Yeah, ask Bernie Madoff. Plenty of money, right? What did he do? Had to get some more. It's not the environment that's the problem. It's my heart and your heart. Thirdly, the heart is a search place. God knows our hearts. Psalm 44, 20 and 21 says, if we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Every individual here has some secrets of their heart. Some things you'd rather other people didn't know. You wouldn't tell them somebody else. Not their business. 
Maybe you're actually a Red Sox fan, but you've been faking it and rooting for the Yankees, and people think you're a Yankee fan, but in your heart of hearts, you're a Red Sox. No, that's probably not the case here, is it? Every one of us has a heart filled with secrets, and God knows our hearts. I'm not saying all your secrets are bad. I'm saying, though, God knows our hearts. Hearts. I've been pastoring for a while and I've had the sacred honor of burying many, many, many individuals. And I've been to many, many, many funerals, done many, many of those funerals and participated in many wakes. And it is a strange thing. Sometimes when someone loses someone else, someone will put their arm around them and say, I know how you feel. Listen to the words of Proverbs 14:10. This is how close our, our heart is. It says, the heart knows its own bitterness and no stranger shares its joy. No one knows how much you hurt. No one knows how much you have joy. No one but God. Your heart is a closed book to everyone but God. But God knows our heart. He knows the secrets of our heart. But fourthly, the heart is a spiritual place. It's where God deals with us. God deals with us heart to heart. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Where does God light us up? In our hearts. In our hearts. I know that you came to church today because you want to have some sort of God connection. And you're trying to figure it out. How do you have a God connection? Well, I'm in church physically, right? That must give me some sort of God connection. Not so much. I'm mentally engaged in what's going on. That gives me some sort of God connection. Mm, not so much. A God connection is heart to heart. It involves the mental. It involves the physical, but primarily it's heart to heart. It's where God touches us, our hearts. And then finally, the heart is a strategic place. Our lives, my life and your life, are governed from where? Our hearts. If you have set in your heart to do something, Unless you have a change of heart, you're going to do it. You've had this experience. You have been to the store. You have been to the mall. And you have set your heart on something, have you not? You have looked at that item and you said, not enough money in the paycheck. Not enough money in the checkbook. Not Wait a second. I still have room on my MasterCard. And someone will say to you, it doesn't make sense for you to have this. You don't need this. And they go through all the spew as to why you shouldn't get it. And then you know what you do? You go ahead and get it. If they walk you out of the mall in cuffs and take you home, you get it on QVC because your heart is set on getting that thing. Do I have a witness? But... That works in so many ways in our lives. Not just items that we buy. It works in relationships that we enter into. It works in relationships that we break. Jobs that we take. How we do certain things. We do them because we set our heart on them. Not because they make sense. Not because we ought to do them, but because we have decided in our heart to do them. And until our heart changes, we're going to do it. That's why, listen to what Proverbs says. That's why the author of Proverbs, Solomon says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for flow, from it flow the springs of life. Your life will flow where your heart flows. That's why the soundness, spiritually speaking, of my heart and your heart is critical. Because your heart will pull you where you're going to go. I like to think that intellectually I could make you think differently. But if I make you think differently and your heart's still set on it, it's not going to change. 
it's a heart matter. So having said that, we need to work through what the diseases of the heart are. I know you're excited about this, right? We got these diseases from doing spiritual autopsies. Not really. Disease number one. Before we, we do that, though, here's the thing. I don't know what your heart looks like. Do you know what my heart looks like? No. Then how do, we, how do we examine our heart? Take your Bible and just turn over to the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. I'm going to read it. It's not a complex verse, but it's in little print in this Bible. I don't know what happened to this Bible. The print shrunk. Chapter 4 and verse 12. It says, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow. So the Word of God can cut through everything else to get to my thoughts, etc. And then it says this, And it is a discerner, or it's discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. My job as a preacher is to take the Word of God and to allow it to expose what our hearts really look like. Because it is the ultimate discerner of your heart. You and I may think our heart is one way. That don't matter. The great physician might want to tell you it's something else. You might think, oh, no, no, my heart's in great shape. But your cholesterol numbers come back bad. The doctor says, you're not doing so well. Who are you going to listen to? How you feel right then or your doctor? We have to listen to what God says about our hearts. Let's move then to what he says. It is possible today that we suffer from a closed heart or a stone heart. What's that about? Well, God promised Israel, and in that promise, we have what's called the new covenant. He said, and I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh or a, or a heart that's sensitive to him. See, the problem all of us have initially is we have a closed or stone heart toward God. The Bible says, listen closely, that we're all sinners. So how many sinners are here in the building today? Oh, every, everybody's a sinner. Everyone's a sinner. But listen to what it says. It says we are dead in trespasses and sin. That means we have absolutely, initially, on our own, no real heart for God. Let me illustrate this to you the best way I can. Yesterday... When I came to church for a few minutes, meaning just to stay a couple of seconds, it came to my attention that outside near the mailbox was a dead squirrel carcass. And it stunk. The dead squirrel carcass needed to leave the area. I had two choices. I could walk over to the squirrel and try and scare it away. Or I'd get me a shovel, pick it up, and throw it out. Guess what I did? I got me a shovel, picked it up, and threw it out. Why? Because dead squirrels don't do anything you ask them to do. You can scream at them. You can yell at them. You can, you can, you can curse at them. You can try motivational speeches with them. But they don't do nothing. Why? Because they're dead. The problem you and I, so I picked it up, took it up, threw it over, it's on the railroad tracks here if anybody wants some, something, wants some vittles. The problem you and I have initially is that because of the sin that is in our life, and that's true of all of us. Who is that true of? All of us. Oh, I was brought up in church. It don't matter whether you were brought up in church. It doesn't matter what you were brought up in. Your initial problem, my initial problem, is my heart is closed to God because of my sinful nature. I'm closed. I'm closed. And I need new life. 
I need new life. And here he says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll give you a new heart. We have not given our hearts to Jesus Christ, and thus we need an opening of our heart. Or we need, you can even say it, open heart surgery if you want. We need a change. How you like to see how it comes right in the heart? Let me show it to you again. Oh. Listen to the book of Acts, the 16th chapter and the 14th verse. Paul was preaching at Philippi. He was out by the river. And he came across a woman named Lydia from Thyatira. She worked in the garment district with purple. Look what it says about Lydia in verse 14. It says she's a worshiper of God. God. And then at the end of the verse it says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Here she was, a religious person, but her heart was closed. And God opened her heart. She had open heart surgery and got a new heart. Sometimes in Christendom we throw around words and people go, wait, what are you talking about? We say, you need to be born again. And someone goes, what are you talking about? You need to be regenerated. What are you talking about? What we're talking about is that act of God by which he comes into our life and gives us a new life and makes us a different person. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've, I, I, I've had that. Let me just tell you this, and I mean this in all gentleness and respect. If you're not sure you've had it, you've not had it. Because I know when I was born the first time, and I know when I was born the second time, I know that th something happened, and something was different. That is the first situation we must deal with. The second is a little different. We can have a hardened or slow heart. Having become a believer and follower of Christ, we find this, word, this warning. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. In other words, the children of Israel had an opportunity to obey God, and they said no. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. This is what happens. God talks to us, speaks to us through his word. And he says, do this. And we go, you know what? Not so much now. Okay, how about this? You know what? Not so much now. And pretty soon what we do is we keep saying no to God and our hearts become hard. We ignore or reject the work of God's Holy Spirit in our lives and thus now we need a contrite heart. In Acts, excuse me, in Psalm 51, verse 17, you remember David, right? The king? David was a perfect person, right? Not so much. David messed up big time. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. And for nine months, he acted like nothing happened. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm good. Good. How are you? Good. How are you today, King David? Fine. I'm good. How are you? Good. 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 But he had a secret sin. And finally, when he got right with God, he says this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. What God would have us to do is to be broken. Is to be broken. And then there's the possibility of a polluted heart. Psalm 66, verse 18 says, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Now this word cherished iniquity is very, very interesting to me. I think of it as taking care of a sin. Now, like I said before, how many sinners are in a house? So we're all going to fail, right? But sometimes we have something we know is wrong. I mean, we just know it's wrong. We know it's wrong, right? And we know God doesn't want us to do it anymore. And God tells us, let it go. And we go, let what go? 
I got my pet sin here. No, no, leave the pet sin alone. I'm cherishing it. I'm taking care of it. Let that sin go. Oh, what sin? It says the Lord doesn't hear us when they're in that, we're in that state. We're polluted. What do I do when I have that situation? What do I need? Well, I have a blockage in the form of sins hindering my love for God and for others, and thus I need a cleanse heart. Psalm 51, verse 10, just a little bit before the verse we just read, says, it's, it's a prayer, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I need God to wash me from that sin. I need to confess it to him full and upright. I need to say, God, this is what I've been doing. This is where I've been. This is what's up. You already knew, but I'm telling you it's wrong. I'm telling you I'm willing to let it go. Cleanse me. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and wash away or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then it's possible to have an unstable heart. Paul, in speaking to the Ephesus believers, wants them to change so that they would no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. That's a mouthful. But the picture here is of someone who is unstable, who they hear a teaching one day, oh, that's wonderful. Then they hear something else over here, oh, Oh, that's great. I heard something on Oprah and then I heard something on the television then I heard something on the radio and then I did that and I've read these six books. Oh, it's just great. And they're all over the place. All over the place. That's not healthy. We are easily and frequently swayed by whatever comes our way and thus we need an established heart. A firm heart. A heart with a foundation and an anchor. In 1 Thessalonians 3.13, the Apostle Paul speaks of the fact that they need to have an established heart that they might be blameless before God. What are the chances of you having ups and downs in your life? 100%. There are three types of people in this world. Someone who's about to go through a difficult time some people who are going through a difficult time, and some people who just came out of a difficult time. Those are the three types of people in this world. You and I are going to have ups and downs all the time, and we must have hearts that are fixed. Finally, ooh, I hate this one. It's possible to have a divided heart. You see, when Christ comes into our life, he gives us a new heart but we still retain an old nature that we like to please. That we like to please. Now, I am about 30 pounds lighter than I used to be. And when I weighed a little bit more, I had strong urges to eat chocolate on a regular basis. I wish I could tell you the urges were gone. I replaced most of my chocolate eating, not all of it, because I'm Dave, not Saint Dave. With apples, oranges, grapes, and other things that resemble rabbit food. <laughs> Though I have lost the weight, I still could go out right now and have me one triple, thick, double, whatever chocolate thing. I still have the desire. But I know the consequences. We have divided hearts. We know what we should want. But oftentimes those old desires creep in. And if we feed them, they become strong and they win. And we give in to them. Matthew 6, 21 and 24, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It goes on to say, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God, mammon, or God in money. The desire to have money 
can rule you and I. The desire to have things can rule you and I. The desire to be somebody or the desire to give into the flesh can rule us. The desire to serve the kingdom of Dave, not the kingdom of God, is a real problem. Our loyalties are divided between doing what God wants and what our flesh wants, and thus we need a united heart. Psalm 86, verse 11, David the psalmist says, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. And then he says this, Unite my heart to fear your name. Under the banner of serving God, my two natures, as it were, need to be united and go forward to serve God. As we wrap this up now, the question we begin with today or end with today is which is your heart or which is my heart? A closed heart, a stone heart, a, a heart that's not been awakened yet to God. A hardened or a slowed heart, a, a heart that used to be one place but now is fighting God. A polluted heart, a, a heart that's keeping some pet stuff. An unstable heart, a heart that's all over the place. A divided heart, a heart that has not decided whether it will serve God or serve self, serve God or serve flesh. Which is your heart? So what's it to me? What is the condition of my heart today? Is there an area I need to deal with? Do I suffer from spiritual heart disease of some sort? Here's the thing. <laughs> by the time that you deal with the spiritual heart problem that you have, by the time you deal with it, by the time it's evident to other people, it's a problem. So where do you deal with it? Quietly? privately now we're going to partake of the Lord's table in just a minute or have communion but our communion is based on something called the new covenant listen to what the new covenant is this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days declares the Lord I will put my law within them I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is what we're talking about, that God consciousness, that new birth, that new life. This whole thing about communion and Jesus and a new heart is this new covenant that God wants to make with us. He wants to write his stuff on our hearts. He wants to give us a new heart. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You see, we're going to talk over the next months, two months really, about transformation. We're going to give you all these little cool steps to transformation. We're going to show you all these passages for transformation. But here's the deal. Transformation begins and ends where? The heart. And if you don't have a new life, if you've not become a follower of Christ, if God hasn't given you a new heart, all I'm going to say to you is worthless. Because the new heart is the whole deal. Without it, you can't change. You can, you can, you can, you can you know, put on some different clothes, a different smile, but you can't change the way you need to change the way I need to change. Romans 10, 9 speaks of how we become these followers of Christ. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, note the fresh phrase, you will be what? Saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified or made right with God. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. What it's saying there? If, is, if I will transfer my faith from myself to Christ, I experience this thing called salvation. But I must indeed begin by confessing Christ as Lord. That means, Jesus, I've made a mess. It's your turn. 
and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, if I will place my faith in him, I will be saved. I will have a new life. I will have entered into that transaction. Thirty-eight years ago, Friday, on a dock in Scroon Lake, New York, as a 14-year-old boy, I made this decision. I'm a sinner. <laughs> I can't get to heaven on my own. I need God. Jesus died for me and rose again. I believe that and I want him as my Lord and Savior. On that dock, on a cold October day, I simply opened my heart. Or better said, God opened my heart. And I came to faith. And that's when I got a new life. And I've never been the same. Have I been perfect? Ooh, no. Have I been holy? Ooh, no. Have I been struggling? Ooh, yes. But until I took that step, I had no hope. I had no strength. I had no peace. I had nothing. But once I took that step, things began to change. Have you taken that step? I'm not sure. I don't mean to, I don't, I, I don't mean, I'm not trying to condemn you or judge you. Did you know that, have, do you know you've been physically born? You're pretty sure of that, right? Yeah. Childbirth is hereditary. If your parents didn't have kids, it's a good chance you won't, right? Give it a minute. You know you've had a new birth. You're not thinking maybe you did, you know it. You say, Pastor, I, I don't know. I, I, listen to Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone who is arrogant in heart, everyone who's proud, is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. The first step in all this is admitting that I need him. The second step is placing my faith in him, turning my life over him, to him, and the result is whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We'll have a new life. We'll have that heart of stone replaced with a heart of flesh. Let's pray together. Maybe you find yourself today in the same place I found myself those many years ago, knowing that you need Christ, willing to admit you need Christ, willing to admit you need God. Still some questions, but knowing that this is what you need. In the quietness of this moment, Remember, God deals with us how? Heart to heart. Why not right now deal with him and talk to him? Talk to God right now and just say something like this from your heart to him. God, I know I'm a sinner. You know I'm a sinner. I've hurt you and I've hurt others. I'm not perfect. I know that Jesus came to die on that cross for me, for my sins. I should have died for my own sins, but he died in my place. He died for my sins. And he rose again, showing that I could be right with you because of him. So right now, God, I'm asking you to come into my life. I'm asking that Jesus be my Lord and Savior. I'm asking for a new life from you. And you say, whoever will call on your name will be saved. I'm calling, save me. Give me a new life from this day forward. Amen. Every head still bowed, every eye closed. Perhaps today, you understood this today, maybe for the first time, and you prayed that prayer 
your words to God and you meant it. With no one looking around other than me, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today and I meant it. Anyone like that? Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Anyone else? Yes. I see those hands. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. I'm going to ask you to do one other thing today. I'm going to ask us all to stand. And those of you who raised your hand, I'm just going to ask you to publicly affirm. Now, if you're not comfortable doing it, don't. I understand that. But I think it would be a great step for you if you would simply, as Jonathan plays, join me here at the altar and we'll pray together before we celebrate communion. Those of you who raised your hand. Lord, please work in all of us the thing that is pleasing to you. Lord, please work in all of us that which we need to do. Help these, Lord, who've made a commitment to you to grow in that, Lord. We commit them to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, it would be good for you. I'm not going to pressure you. I'm not going to hurt you or anything. Just come and meet me here at the altar and we'll pray together. Jonathan plays, we invite you to come.